Things are really starting to heat up in the race to succeed. Jason Kenney is Premier of Alberta and the new leader of the UCP. Former Alberta Finance Minister Travis Taves is one of the candidates who's hoping to secure enough of the vote to become our new leader. MLA Travis Taves joins us now from Edmonton. Travis, welcome to Bridge City News. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. Now, there's been a bit of infighting within the party, within the UCP. What do you think it will really take to unite the Conservatives once again as we head into next year's provincial election? Sure. You know, there's there's been a lot of division uh, in the last couple of years in our communities, um, you know, businesses, sadly, even in some of our, our faith communities, churches, and, and tragically, even in families. Our Conservative movement hasn't been exempt of that division. And, uh, you know, as I travel around the province and and hear from conservative-minded Albertans, I'm always interested in their perspective in terms of how do we go on from here? Because it's been a tough two years. No, I would suggest there's a couple of things that are very important. Number one, I really believe that it'll be critical for our big tent diverse party, our big tent diverse conservative movement, that we again focus on those core values that unite us, the values of uh, fiscal responsibility, a commitment to you know, a market-based economy, and the commitment to uh, the value, core value of individual freedom and liberty and limited government. And I believe if we can focus again on those core values, the values that united us in 2019, uh, that, that we can again come together. Instead of focusing on those issues that divide, those issues will always be there. But look, we have a big tent diverse uh, movement and party. That's also what makes us strong. I believe that's also what makes us fit to govern. Now, we talk about a big tent, obviously, but what about social conservatives within the party? How can you ensure as leader that they won't be shut out? Well, look, um, many of my personal views would align with the views of social conservatives. That's, that's where I am personally. And yet, I, I deeply respect the views of others right across um, the spectrum of our conservative movement. There, you know, there are many, many uh, positions held on, on social issues uh, held passionately by really good people right across the spectrum. And we have to, we have to recognize that and respect that. Um, I, again, I will ensure that every MLA has a voice in this caucus, that every MLA has the ability to bring their views and the views of their constituents passionately to the caucus table. I've got a plan to manage caucus so that all MLAs can firstly represent their constituents fairly and accurately and secondly, bring their own personal views to the table and advocate for those. Rachel Notley and the NDP have been acting like a government in waiting, coming up with plans to help our economy get back on track. What do you think it'll take to help many of our small to medium business owners get back to black like the province is trying to get right now as we make our way out of the pandemic? I know we no longer have the, uh, the deficit, but we still have a debt that we're tackling. Sure. Well, well, one thing we won't do is what the NDP did in 2015. And that's raise taxes, create extra regulatory burden and hurdles that sent tens of billions of dollars of capital out of the province and ultimately um, undermined our economic growth in this province, uh, put us really into recession and left far less opportunity for our small businesses and entrepreneurs. The last two years has been, have been very tough for many of our small businesses, especially those in hospitality, uh, those in accommodation, tourism, for instance. Now, Alberta uh, provided more support than any other province to our small businesses, but I don't want to pretend that that support covered all the losses. It didn't. I know it's been tough. Look, I'm a small business owner as well. The way we've benefited and the way we've seen others benefit is, is when we see general strength in the economy. When there's investment returning back to the province, when folks are moving back into Alberta like they are again today, that creates increasing opportunity for entrepreneurs and small businesses to benefit um, in, in their business enterprises. So again, I we will do, I would do, if I have the privilege of serving Albertans as their premier, I will continue to do all I can to ensure Alberta is most competitive in all of our key sectors, including to the tourism sector, which we have great potential and we have great plans to ultimately grow that sector, but also in areas like you know the, the petrochemical industry where tens of billions of dollars are stacked up to come in. The tech sector right now is growing in leaps and bounds. I've understood there's, there's 3,000 unfilled positions in Calgary alone in the tech sector. 
We're seeing strength in film and television. We've seen that industry grow from $100 million a year to over a billion an annually. We're seeing strength in the manufacturing sector, de Havilland. They announced that they were going to move their water bomber manufacturing plant, not into Quebec, where they get government subsidy, but right here into Alberta. All of that investment coming into the province, I believe, will position Alberta small businesses for recovery and growth in the years ahead. My commitment is to ensure that government creates the most competitive playing field possible. And lastly, the other issue that's really plaguing growth in Alberta businesses is a limitation on labor and talent and skills. Ultimately, employers across sectors and regions are looking for staff and they're having trouble finding those staff. Now, when I was finance minister, I added $600 million to, to better prepare Albertans to engage in this workforce. I did that in the context of a balanced budget. I need to point that out. But we've got a bit of a misalignment with skills. Uh, for many Albertans today, we need to ensure that we're investing in those individuals so they can participate in this new and more diverse economy. So, Travis, you talked about, you know, how Alberta is trying to diversify its economy, not just the energy sector, but the IT sector with technology, film and television. What about our farmers? What can you really do to help our producers if you become leader? You, you, you know that, uh, you know, one of our core businesses is, is a cattle ranching operation. I'm a past president of the Canadian Cattlemen's Association. I have great affection for agriculture, and I believe it has incredible potential in the province of Alberta. Look, I came from New York a few months ago as the Minister of Finance meeting with, with the investment community, as you would expect. Um, virtually every conversation morphed to North American energy and food security. Alberta has not only a great opportunity, I suggest a deep responsibility to get on with the responsible, responsible production of both energy and agriculture. And we need to do all we can to position those sectors to be most competitive. I'll be rolling out an agriculture platform here in the upcoming days that will make additional moves on improving the competitiveness of Alberta's agriculture industry and agriculture manufacturing and processing sector. But when I was Minister of Finance, I approved um, major uh, generational investments in irrigation. Again, I've, I've been, um, you know, as I travel Southern Alberta and I see the incredible generational investments that were made at the early part of the 1900s that have served families and communities so well generation after generation, I was inspired to invest further in that agriculture uh, and irrigation sector. Um, I was also instrumental in funding the twinning, the beginning of the twinning of Highway 3, which again was, is key infrastructure that, meant that agriculture manufacturers and processors have suggested needs to be improved for them to land their investment here in the province. Now you talk about a lot of your previous successes and accomplishments as finance minister here in Alberta, but a number of Albertans were quite upset during the province's negotiations with our nurses and what appeared to be a pay cut for our healthcare professionals right in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. We weren't out of the woods yet. So how do you respond to that as our province's former finance minister? Sure. Well, I mean, that's, that's just simply misinformation. There, there was no pay cut. In fact, I look at, at the negotiations with the public sector broadly, which fell under, under my leadership. Now, it, what, that didn't include positions, but I was responsible for all of our um, collective bargaining agreements. And I adjusted our, our labor mandate twice in the last 18 months because I had two principles that governed our approach. Number one, we had fiscal objectives, as you would expect as we should have. But secondly, I had a, a second principle and that was the principle of fairness to both our public sector workers and to ensure that we had a settlement that was fair in the eyes of Albertans, that's important. And so that required an adjustment in the summer of 2021 to the labor mandate, which include increases. I would suggest material increases for our public sector workers and that included our nurses. So I was so pleased when we uh, ultimately completed the, the negotiations with the nurses and nurses ratified the agreement by um, a rate of over 90% in January. In fact, I quoted Heather Smith in my budget speech because her words were so conciliatory to how well the process went. Nurses did end up with a raise. They also uh, ended up with, and appropriately so, with a recognition of their great contribution during this, the last two years during the pandemic. And, and again, we did that all without one day of labor stoppage. 
We did all of that without any political co or conflict and, and rhetoric in the media. I believe we did it very constructively. Now, Travis, a number of communities, including right here in Lethbridge, are not happy with the province deciding to centralize EMS dispatch services. Many in various communities say it, for it takes far too long for an ambulance to arrive. Now, that extra time could mean the difference between life and death, all in an effort to save, what, around $6 million annually? If you became Premier, would EMS be decentralized so municipalities can take back control once again? But look, on, on that issue, I know that Minister Copping is working with municipalities and service providers on the issue, but here, this is my broad approach. Based on my observations, uh, AHS is failing Albertans and more importantly, frontline healthcare professionals because of their highly centralized decision-making structure. My direction is always to de decentralize. I believe the best decisions are made by those closest to the front lines. And that would go for EMS as well. Now let's talk about gas prices for just a moment here. Why is it, in your opinion, that in Toronto motorists are paying about a buck sixty a litre, while many here in Alberta, including right here in Lethbridge, is a dollar eighty-three, even though the province paused the fuel tax of thirteen cents a litre? How would you address this issue as premier? Sure. Well, I will say Ontario followed Alberta's lead eventually in reducing their their fuel tax as well. And uh, right now, we, I check gas prices, as you would expect, I check them quite regularly. And there's about a five cent differential. I think Ontario right now, Toronto is about five cents lower than Alberta. And uh, there are also, you know, as we know, many dynamics that take place in terms of fuel pricing. Sometimes you'll get a price war going on in a certain region and that can drop prices sometimes five, 10, even 15 or 20 cents. But what I know is this, uh, after suspending the fuel tax, Alberta, has, has had the lowest on average fuel prices in, in the whole country uh, during the time on average. That's really important. Let's look at prices in Montreal or Vancouver. They're, they're you know, massively higher than they are here in Alberta today. And I, I will commit, and I have committed, that if I have the privilege of serving Albertans as Premier, I will bring that fuel tax suspension program and make it permanent. Uh, Here's the reality, Albertans can benefit from an owned resource. And when energy prices go up, our revenues as a government from non-renewable resource royalties eclipse that of the fuel tax. And that, us, that allows us to ensure that when energy prices are high, the fuel tax comes off, meaning that Albertans have, will have, by and large, the lowest fuel prices in the country. A number of premiers, Travis said, during the pandemic that a number of missteps were made because this is uncharted waters, uncharted territory for many of our leaders during the pandemic. What missteps do you think were made within the Kenny government and what do you think maybe the government can learn from this or you can learn from it potentially as a leader to help you to grow and be even a better leader? Sure. No, that, that's a great question. And, and I will say this, that, you know, the, the government uh, navigated the, the time of the pandemic very imperfectly. And, and, and I know that for sure. I know, I know of certain mistakes that I could call out today. And I know there were other errors that uh, per perhaps we're not even aware of yet. Number one, I would appoint uh, an independent body to do a third party review on the government of Alberta's response during COVID. Look, I think it's going to be, I think it's critically important that uh, Albertans know where the government made perhaps responsible, correct decisions and where the government erred over the last two years. I think that's critically important. And it's critically important to inform future governments should we face uh, a challenge like this in the future. One other learning was to be very careful to, um, in making definitive statements. The easiest way to break trust with an electorate is to make a definitive statement and go back on that statement or your word. That immediately uh, breaches trust uh, between, between a government and, and constituents. One thing we also learned is that Alberta has um, very inadequate healthcare capacity, particularly in, in key areas like ICU. You know, I, I didn't realize this going in, but Alberta, the highest funding healthcare jurisdiction in Canada on a per capita basis, had the lowest number of baseline ICU beds on a per capita basis. That, that ultimately limited the runway materially in terms of the options that government had. So one thing that I, I'm committed to, and one thing budget 2022 actually also reflects is additional investment in healthcare to expand healthcare capacity in key areas where the pandemic showed we were very deficient, including ICU capacity. 
Well, we only have a couple of moments left here, Travis, but I wanted to talk about the anti-Ottawa sentiment here in Alberta it continues to grow. Many Albertans feel a really strong disconnect with the Trudeau Liberals. There's even more talk of Western separation. What do you say to those who want to see Alberta become its own sovereign nation? Well, look, I, I absolutely agree that we need to take a page out of Quebec's playbook and make incremental changes that, that improve Alberta's lot in Confederation. But one of those pages is not separation. You know, when, when Quebec got close to separation, threatened to separate, there were a lot of things that took place. One of them was tens of billions of dollars of capital fled that economy. As I talked to folks who were close to the issue, they said you couldn't rent a moving van in Montreal for a year and a half with all the head offices that moved from Montreal down to Toronto and Bay Street. That's what helped build Bay Street. I will not take that approach as the premier of the province. We've made great gains in this economy. We cannot see those eroded. But what we can do is take a page out of Quebec's playbook in this way. Every time Quebec has had a government in Ottawa that needs Quebec politically, and that's been far too often with the Liberals holding power too many years in this country, Quebec has made incremental gains because they've known they've had significant political clout. Alberta's not done that. You know, we had, we were governed extremely well during the Harper years as a nation, I believe. But during that time, when we had a conservative government in, in Ottawa, that depends on Alberta politically. I can't identify one material change that we made to equalization, for instance, or fiscal stabilization, any federal fiscal transfer program. I, you know, we didn't make a move on an, on an Alberta pension plan or lobby hard for tax points to erode Alberta's tax or Ottawa's taxation power right. and move that power to provinces. We can never let an opportunity like that pass again. Now, there are many things we can do between now and when we get a more favorable government in Ottawa. We won't sit on our hands, but I would suggest this. I would bring an assertive and strategic approach, not the approach that has failed Albertans in the past, one full of political bluster and rhetoric over-promising and under-delivering. Former Alberta Finance Minister and current UCP leadership candidate, Travis Taves, thanks so much for joining us today from Edmonton. It's, my, it's been my pleasure. Thank you, Hal.